So for the first time in recorded history, it appears as though the average level of intelligence is actually dropping in uh, pretty much every Western nation that this has been studied in. And though this is widely disputed in certain circles, and it's not exactly clear why this is actually happening, I always tend to think that dietary measures have something to do with these types of trends. And so in this video, we're going to be talking about dietary measures that you can implement to avoid being stupid. I have an IQ of 48 and I'm what some people call mentally retarded. Hello. <laughs> now we're going to talk about a handful of dietary measures in this video. However, it's hard to dive into dietary measures without first mentioning water intake. Now dehydration specifically, um, it's not exactly clear if we are any more dehydrated these days than our ancestors were. However, it is extremely clear that dehydration has a very clear impact on intelligence and cognitive function, and which is why it's so important to stay hydrated. Now, the reason for this is obviously that uh, water is literally the foundational nutrient uh, or molecule that your body needs in order to operate properly. Uh, I talk about this all the time. You can go several weeks without eating food, but you will die if you just go simply a few days without consuming water. Now, there are a couple of ways that dehydration can impact and negatively impact uh, cognitive function. And the first one is that um, when you are dehydrated, there is a reduction in blood volume. And what this specifically does is it will reduce the amount of oxygen that is available to the brain. And when you reduce the amount of oxygen that the brain is able to get because of a reduction in blood volume, uh, you reduce the amount of ATP that neurons can create, which is obviously the fundamental basic form of energy that every cell in your body needs in order to operate properly. And so when you reduce blood volume, you reduce oxygen, which reduces ATP formation, which again will reduce cognitive function and intelligence. And then the second way that dehydration negatively impacts cognitive function is by disrupting electrolyte uh, balance in the bloodstream and in the nervous system. And uh, the reason this is such a big deal is that electrolytes are absolutely essential to proper nerve function. They are the fundamental uh, molecules that are required by nerves to carry out electrical signals between neurons. And so when your electrolyte balance is off because of dehydration, it will have a negative impact on cognitive function. Now, it's hard to say exactly how much water you might need as an individual. Uh, this is largely dependent on a ton of different factors from body weight to age to activity level, as well as how much water you're getting through your food. However, a good rule of thumb here is simply three to four liters per day, and you can kind of increase your water water intake uh, depending on those various factors. Uh, and if you want to take this a step even further, it's also really important to prioritize your electrolyte intake in order to avoid being stupid, which is why today's video is actually sponsored by Element. Now, for those of you that aren't quite aware yet, Element is a perfectly proportioned mix of electrolytes of sodium, potassium, and magnesium that is specifically formulated to meet the electrolyte needs of those that are active and are losing electrolytes through sweat. And so if you are even moderately active, prioritizing electrolytes through consuming something like Element is a fantastic idea to improve not just physical performance, but also cognitive performance as well. Most of the electrolyte recommendations that you'll hear are based on figures that are ideal for those that are completely inactive. And so if you are at least moderately active, consuming higher levels of electrolytes through something like Element can be a fantastic idea to help improve overall performance. Now they are currently offering you guys a free sample pack with any order and so if you're looking for something like this, an electrolyte drink that doesn't have any of the artificial sweeteners and flavors that most of the other products on the market have, make sure to check out the link down below or go to drinkelement.com slash nutrition library to snag this offer. Now the second dietary measure to be aware of when trying to optimize cognitive performance and improve intelligence is just to simply avoid eating too much food. 
Now, the obvious reason for this is that there is a direct correlation between the rise in obesity levels over the past 40 to 50 years with the drop in intelligence levels over the same time span. Now, uh, correlation doesn't obviously always mean causation. However, there are very specific mechanisms involved with obesity that lend towards a reduction in intelligence. And because overeating is the primary fundamental cause of obesity, it's probably going to be in your best interest to avoid eating too much food in order to avoid being obese and leading to a reduction in cognitive performance. Now, the primary means by which obesity decreases cognitive performance and intelligence is through its effects on low-grade inflammation. Now, inflammation in the body has a whole host of negative effects, and it's kind of like this ethereal word that just gets thrown around a ton, but it is a very real phenomenon. And when you are obese, there is low-grade inflammation throughout the entirety of the body, including the neurons, which leads to neural inflammation and increase in uh, inflammatory cytokines, which hinders uh, the production of neurotransmitters. It hinders proper nerve signaling through the disruption of ion channels. It causes oxidative stress, which can lead to neurotoxicity and also hinders neurogenesis. However, obesity isn't the only means by which uh, overeating can cause negative impacts on cognitive health. Overeating can also have more acute effects as well. Yes, overeating can uh, lead to obesity, which has an obvious negative impact on cognitive performance, but even eating one particular meal that is hypercaloric can also lead to detrimental effects on cognitive performance, primarily through the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's simply the uh, side of the nervous system that is activated during times of rest and digestion. And so when you overeat and overconsume calories, there is an overactivation of this nervous system, which can have several short-term detrimental effects on acute cognitive performance. Now, there are several mechanisms by which this happens, and one of them, if not the most primary, mechanism is through the actions of insulin. Now, insulin isn't necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, insulin is simply a hormone that is used by your body to uh, get glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cells where they can be utilized. However, insulin also allows for the permeability of tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier, uh, which is why when you consume a heavy carbohydrate meal, you typically will feel really tired afterwards. And the reason for this is that insulin allows tryptophan, which is the precursor to the neurotransmitter serotonin, to cross the blood-brain barrier, which immediately increases levels of serotonin, which suppresses levels of dopamine and norepinephrine. Now, these aren't, again, necessarily bad things. However, if throughout the day you're trying to, uh, to optimize focus, attention, and things of that nature, you you do not want to activate this hormone um, and cause a reduction in the neurotransmitters, namely dopamine and norepinephrine, that are responsible for focus and attention. Now, insulin also causes an increase in the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which uh, gets a lot of attention kind of like in the nootropic community for being a neurotransmitter that's responsible for the consolidation of memory, which is very true. However, I think there's a large misunderstanding about the role of acetylcholine primarily surrounding its effects on the parasympathetic nervous system. Acetylcholine is the primary neurotransmitter responsible for initiating the neuroparasympathetic response, which means that it's largely inhibitory and also means that if you're trying to optimize specifically focus and attention, you don't necessarily want to increase acetylcholine in those moments. But yes, acetylcholine is extremely important for memory consolidation. However, memory consolidation usually happens during periods of rest. And so if you're trying to optimize uh, attention and focus during the day, 
consuming large meals which also increase acetylcholine probably isn't uh, going to be your best bet. Now, insulin also tends to stimulate the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA as well as uh, inhibit the release of the stimulatory neurotransmitter glutamate in some very specific brain regions that are responsible for high mental acuity. And because of all these reasons, it's usually not going to be a good idea to consume a large meal, a large insulin stimulating meal uh, before a mentally demanding task. Now, the primary means by which people try to avoid the negative impact of insulin on cognitive performance is by consuming um, a diet that is lower in the macronutrients, carbohydrates, and proteins, which are uh, generally insulin stimulating, um, and consuming something like a ketogenic diet, which does not stimulate insulin release. However, it should be noted that fat can also stimulate the parasympic nervous system, primarily through its actions on CCK. Now, cholecystokinin is a hormone that gets released in the presence of fat in order to stimulate bile release, which helps your body to digest fats. But this neurohormone, this neuropeptide, can also stimulate the parasympic nervous system. And so about the only way to avoid the stimulation of uh, the parasympic nervous system is to either um, consume no calories whatsoever or to consume moderate amounts of calories and to time them well, which is what we're going to talk about next, calorie timing. Now, because you can't go forever without consuming calories, without just absolutely wasting away in the attempt of never stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, there are instances, especially in instances where you are trying to optimize muscle growth, which sometimes require a hypercaloric state, it's really important to time your nutrients well to avoid stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system in periods where you don't want to. Now, there are several means by which to do this and none of them are absolutely correct and none of them really have any research behind them. But they're, they're kind of just more intuitive in nature. However, the first way is to just simply space out your calories evenly throughout the day to avoid any one particular meal being too big and overstimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, for someone like myself, this is personally the approach that I personally take and the reason for this is that yes, I want to optimize my cognitive performance throughout the day. But when I get home at night, I also have three kids and a wife and a home to take care of. And so there's really no optimal point throughout the day where I can just over consume calories and kind of just veg and rest afterwards. And so because of this, I do choose to personally space out my calories as evenly as possible to avoid any one given meal causing an overstimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, for those of you that aren't um, concerned with something like that and do have down periods throughout the day where you um, are, are able to rest and digest more food when compared to other periods of the day, another method is to simply um, eat smaller to no meals throughout the day when you're trying to optimize your cognitive performance and then consume um, most of your calories towards the evening time when you're trying to uh, sit down and digest and recover from the day. Now, another option to this is actually the opposite of that, and that is to front load your calories as opposed to back loading your calories. And this simply means to consume your largest meal in the morning. And the re reason some people choose to do this is because you are more insulin sensitive in the morning time, which means that your body's able to process the blood sugar and the calories that you're consuming in that larger meal in the morning time a little bit better and it can help to blunt that parasympathetic uh, response a little bit better than consuming or backloading your calories towards the evening time. Now, another possible method that I especially like to use on workout days is to simply eat uh, your largest meal after a workout. And this again has a very similar principle to consuming your largest meal in the morning time. And that is that after a workout, 
you're one very insulin sensitive, which means you're not you don't have to secrete as much insulin in order to get blood glucose and nutrients out of the bloodstream and into cellular structures. And the second reason is because of the activation of AMPK. Now, AMPK is also a nutrient sensing receptor on cells that gets activated in response to exercise and is actually a means by which your body is able to get nutrients out of the bloodstream, namely sugar and fat and protein, out of the bloodstream and into cells independent of insulin. And so if you consume your largest meal throughout the day directly after a workout, your body is somewhat primed uh, more efficiently to handle those nutrients and it won't throw you into as big of a parasympathetic state. Now, another method of caloric timing that doesn't often get talked about is simply going into a long-term calorie deficit. A lot of guys that go into a long-term calorie deficit for the purpose of losing weight will notice that there's an increase in cognitive output. And the reason for this is that you're significantly suppressing your overall parasympathetic state because of the lack of long-term calories. Now, there's a few reasons for this. One is that you're obviously not able to eat large meals throughout the day. Uh, but the second reason is that when you're in an overall calorie deficit, there's an overall suppression of the parasympathetic state. Now, obviously, again, you can't do this forever and you will have to go through periods of calorie maintenance or calorie surplus in order to maintain uh, body mass and uh, muscle mass. However, for very specific time spans, you can go into an overall caloric deficit for the purpose of improving cognitive performance. Now, the last dietary strategy that I'm going to talk about before we close this video out is simply prioritizing very specific nutrients for the purpose of improving overall cognitive health and performance. And the first one I want to talk about is omega-3 fatty acids. Now, the reason that I want to talk about this one first is because it's arguably one of the most important when it comes to uh, prioritizing your cognitive health. And the reason for that is that omega-3 fatty acids are extremely integral at controlling the neuroinflammatory response. And the reason for this is that omega-3 fatty acids are direct precursors to anti-inflammatory cytokines. And as we've previously talked about in regards to obesity, neuroinflammation is extremely detrimental to overall cognitive health and performance. Now, it's hard to talk about omega-3 fatty acids without also talking about omega-6 fatty acids, which are essentially the opposite of omega-3 fatty acids in that they are the direct uh, precursors to inflammatory cytokines. And so when it comes to omega-3 fatty acids, one of the best things that you can just simply do is to, one, prioritize omega-3 fatty acid intake for the purpose of increasing increasing anti-inflammatory cytokines, but to also decrease your omega-6 intake for the purpose of decreasing inflammatory cytokines. Now, there's a lot of argumentation in the literature as to what the proper ratio is, but it is estimated based on anthropological evidence that uh, the ideal ratio is anywhere between 1 to 1 or 1 to 4. And so again, prioritizing omega-3 fatty acid intake and decreasing omega-6 fatty acid intake and have a um, at least a marginal impact on neural inflammation and improve cognitive perform performance through that mechanism. Now, there are a handful of other nutrients that are worth prioritizing that I do want to also briefly cover here. One is uh, simply the B vitamins, the class of vitamins that are known as B vitamins. They are extremely important for the overall processing of calories, uh, specifically glucose, uh, but pretty much every nutrient, uh, B vitamins are intricately involved in taking these nutrients, utilizing them properly, and turning them into energy. And so um, B vitamins are extremely important to prioritize through things like meat um, and uh, eggs and liver and organ meats and things of that nature. They are packed with B vitamins, but you also want to prioritize choline, which uh, for the longest time was thought to be a B vitamin, which is uh, no longer considered to be a B vitamin, but uh, choline is extremely 
extremely important for overall methylation in the body, but is also involved, obviously, in the production of acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter responsible largely for memory consolidation. So prioritizing choline throughout the day can be a fantastic way to optimize acetylcholine levels, as well as optimize the production of phosphatidylcholine, which is involved in the cellular structures of neurons and the myelination of neurons, which is also important for neural health. But another key nutrient here is magnesium. And again, the reason for this is that magnesium is extremely important as an electrolyte, but it also specifically in regards to neural health can help to reduce neurotoxicity by somewhat inhibiting the over activation of the NMDA receptor. And so magnesium has also been linked to uh, reductions in the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. And so it is fairly clear that magnesium is very important for overall uh, cognitive health, but also cognitive performance. Now, magnesium can be somewhat inhibitory, and so it can be useful to take it or backload it towards the evening time. But a lot of individuals like to take it throughout the day as well to increase absorption, but also to um, inhibit anxiety and stress and things of that nature. Now, another nutrient that seems to be extremely important for overall cognitive health is also vitamin D. Now, vitamin D doesn't often get talked about in regards to cognitive health. However, it is extremely important and the vitamin D receptors um, cause some very specific signaling in the brain that appears to uh, be involved in the production of nerve growth factor, which is a neuropeptide that is extremely involved in the process process of nerve health and neuroplasticity as well. And so uh, if you're experiencing reductions in vitamin D levels throughout the winter time, or you just aren't getting a lot of sunlight during the summer or aren't consuming a lot of things like eggs and dairy, consuming more eggs and dairy as a means of increasing vitamin D levels can be a fantastic way to improve overall cognitive health. Now, another nutrient that's worth mentioning here is creatine. And uh, creatine obviously gets a ton of attention in the fitness community for improving things like muscle growth and muscle performance. However, it also improves neural health and function as well. And the primary reason it does this is through its actions on increasing ATP availability. Now, creatine doesn't just get stored in muscles. It also gets stored in uh, neurons and other cells throughout the body, which uh, pr provides an increase in the availability of ATP, which increases the availability of energy to neurons, which improves uh, a ton of different markers of cognitive health. And so if you are trying to improve your intelligence, your cognitive performance, as well as overall cognitive health, some of the best things that you can do are to simply avoid uh, over-consuming calories, uh, avoid becoming obese, time your calories well if you're in a calorie maintenance or even a calorie surplus for certain periods of time, but it's to also prioritize the nutrients that are absolutely essential to not just overall bodily function, but also cognitive health as well. Now, if you guys are interested in resources or even one-on-one -on -one coaching to help you to uh, develop a supplementation and dietary protocol to help optimize uh, cognitive performance, physical performance, and overall health, please, please feel free to reach out um, or or check out some of the links in the description down below. Uh, but other than that, guys, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment down below, and I think I will see you guys next time.